Audio. Good evening, everybody. I'm Matt Doyle, I'm a GP here in Jersey, and thank you everybody for joining us. Um, so we're, we're thrilled tonight to have two excellent speakers. We're going to start with um, Dr. Emma McSweeney, who is one of the leads at Recognition Health. Emma is a neuroradiologist, currently at St. George's Hospital, with huge expertise in um, cognitive deficit. And we're going to unfortunately have to share her, her slides from our screen um, because of technical issues. So apologies for the next slide, please, that's going to come. But if I hand over to Emma and uh, we shall crack on. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. So thank you very much. Um, this evening I've been asked to talk about medications in dementia, um, but because there's such seismic changes taking place at the moment in the whole sort of uh, treatment of dementia and what's coming next, what I've done is to focus on current treatments, but relatively briefly, and to really talk about what's coming next um, and what patients uh, and we certainly should be both aware of and very excited about. So next, please. Next slide. Um, so one of the problems um, with dementia is that I'm sure, as you're aware, many patients will come to the clinic saying they think they've got dementia or they'll come to our clinic certainly saying they've been diagnosed with dementia. And the problem with this is that obviously it's not a diagnosis. It's really just a, a constellation of uh, symptoms. And by far and away, the most common cause of dementia as we get older is Alzheimer's. So I am, for the purpose of this evening, going to focus primarily on Alzheimer's because that is 90 or more percent of the causes of dementia. So the, the problem as well is that it's not just when we have dementia. The time when we really need to intervene with effective treatment is when we have mild cognitive impairment long before developing the symptoms of dementia. Dementia, as you know, is really just cognitive impairment, which must be in two or more domains. It must be progressive over at least the past year, and it must impact on activities of daily living. Next slide, please. So in 2022, one of the main problems with Alzheimer's is that most people just don't recognize that they have the condition, and it is also difficult to diagnose. And in fact, we did a survey some time ago, but the results are still exactly the same on recent surveys that have been done, which is that about 80% of people don't actually recognize all of the symptoms of dementia. They're aware that remembering recent events is an important symptom, but awareness of other symptoms is very, very poor. Next slide, please. Um, so recognizing the symptoms of mild cognitive impairment and mild in order to be able to make an early diagnosis. And it really is all these other things, abstract thought, calculation problems, visuospatial problems, and this whole bucket of executive function, which is planning, judgment, concept formation, etc. And these symptoms, when you talk to people, you actually do find that they've been present for quite some time and long before they've actually presented and said that they can't remember anything. Next slide, please. So I'm going to talk, as I said, just very briefly on what we call the sort of like treatments for dementia. The first thing to say is that all of this information is obviously, you just need to Google it, it's all on the website. And also it's not really changed in about the last 20 years. So I think everybody is aware of the next two slides, which is essentially the treatments available on the market anywhere in the world, apart from one treatment, which I'll talk about in a minute in the US, are just symptomatic or palliative treatments. And these are the anticholinesterase inhibitors, um, for Alzheimer's, but may also be helpful for Lewy body Parkinson's and cerebral amyloid angiopathy. Rivastigmine is particularly helpful if someone has hallucinations as the main symptom, and about a third of people can't tolerate these medications anyway because of nausea and loss of appetite. Next slide, please. Um, Mamantine tends to be used in the UK for slightly more symptoms, um, or if people can't tolerate anticholinesterase inhibitors. Um, and they work by decreasing brain glutamate. Uh, side effects, again, tend to be headaches, dizziness, and constipation. But unlike the anticholinesterase inhibitors, people actually tend to accommodate to these side effects, and they start to disappear um, after having been on the medication for a few months. Obviously, one re is required to treat the comorbidities, which are quite common in this elderly population. All the things that you're aware of, stroke, heart disease, hypercholesterolemia, depression, anxiety, et cetera. Next slide, please. The challenging behavior is a little bit more difficult. Um, that also uh, goes alongside the, the diagnosis. Um, interestingly, increased agitation and anxiety, these can often present actually quite early. And treating these is important um, because it does adversely, they do adversely affect cognitive symptoms. 
Um, we have several patients coming to us now who, in fact, two or three years before they started to develop problems with short-term memory, actually had unexplained agitation anxiety. And then all these other things, delusions, hallucinations, tend to be referred to psychiatrists, and that tends to be for um, drugs like risperidone or haloperidol, um, particularly haloperidol for vascular dementia, um, risperidone in sort of like low doses for shortest time, um, if other treatments haven't helped. And then obviously antidepressants are sort of like always there. Um, and the drugs like, so Talipram is probably the most useful one to use um, in Alzheimer's because it seems to have a beneficial effect specifically for that condition as well. Next slide, please. But fortunately, a whole new range of treatments, a whole new generation of treatments, um, and now sort of they are actually available. They're currently only available in, in clinical trials, many of which are in final phase. Um, but they really are becoming um, accessible now to patients and are the sort of, like they are the future. And being able, to un being able to access new biomarkers to detect presence of disease very early, and then also provide treatments which when given early will halt or at least slow down further progression of disease has to be the future and has to be so much better than just sort of like treating with palliative or symptomatic treatments. Next, please. So I'd like to sort of like really take you more into a tour of, of this arena. Um, so obviously the biomarker technology permits early accurate diagnosis. Um, and many of these biomarkers are not yet available in the general arena. They are available in the trials where it's essential to be able to use these biomarkers. Um, but I think you will have patients asking you about these, if not already, um, really very soon, because there's so much in the press about this. Um, and then the new generation medications, as I said, are designed to prevent progression of disease and symptoms. Um, what is available so like today, globally in the UK? Well, there's only one drug which is available in the US currently, which I'll talk about in a second, but otherwise these treatments are just available in clinical trials. Next slide, please. So this came out in June, 2021. So just June last year, and it's really sort of caused a massive stir because this is really about the first medication in the last 20 years that's come onto the market or approved by FDA um, to treat Alzheimer's. It's a monoclonal antibody against amyloid, and it's actually designed to treat the underlying disease as opposed to being a symptomatic treatment. And next slide, please. Almost more importantly has been the fact that this has completely revolutionized the rate and um, time at which these new medications are likely to come onto the market. Um, so it's the first disease modifying treatment. Though it's available in the USA, interestingly, there's very, very poor uptake um, because people are actually trying to access the slightly later generation, similar treatments that are still in the trials. Um, but I think this is interesting. <clears throat> the rationale stated by the FDA for approving this medication is absolutely true. I don't think anyone would disagree. Is that Alzheimer's is a disease of greater prevalence and greater lethality than COVID-19. It's an ongoing global pandemic. And it costs America in terms of direct medical costs significantly higher than cancer. So this has really sort of, um, as I said, sort of really stimulated the, the market and certainly the media frenzy in terms of our patients now being very aware of these, these new medications. The particular um, drug itself has been quite controversial, but as I said, it's had a huge impact on awareness. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Next, thank you. So what I just want to do is just do a quick tour on understanding what causes Alzheimer's disease um, in order to understand how these new medications are working. And actually it is just the more we find out, the more increasingly complex this condition is becoming. But as you know, it's mainly due to an abnormal accumulation of these amyloid and tau proteins. So the, okay, no, next slide's fine. <laughs> Next slide, please. So the, the, I'm going to talk first about the amyloid protein. The amyloid protein accumulates outside, obviously inside the brain, but outside the brain cells. And it gets dumped down on top of the brain cells and stops the cognitive brain cells from working normally. So we all have amyloid in the brain. It serves a very positive function. But for some reason, as we get older, some people have a propensity where this beta secretase, which is just shown here as a scissor, starts to overproduce this A-beta amyloid fragment. 
that starts to become overproduced to an extent that the clearance mechanism on the right hand side of the slide is unable to keep pace. So like blood sugar or anything else, it just starts to accumulate in the brain and it forms these amyloid plaques. And it's the amyloid plaques which get dumped down on the brain cells and stop them working normally. And the only way cells can respond to that is they just slowly atrophy and die. But obviously like other brain, other cells in the body, the neuronal cognitive brain cells cannot regenerate. So once you've lost them, they've gone. So this diagram is really just to illustrate that the place where the current medications are working, the ones we've just been talking about, is they help the dying brain cells to function more efficiently. So they're effectively in green. It's the green star here. We're losing our brain cells and all they're doing is trying to just get these brain cells to sort of like produce a bit more, a bit more energy, to be a bit more efficient. But the new medications are designed up here prior to loss of brain cells, and they're designed to either reduce production, to change the um, propensity to aggregation, or to increase the clearance of the abnormally acute accumulated amyloid in order to reestablish the normal equilibrium. And there's lots of different mechanisms of action by which, these, by which these new drugs work, but essentially they're stopping the brain cells from dying in the first place. Next mm -hmm. slide, please. <clears throat> So this is how the tau protein works. The tau protein is inside the brain cells and normally it acts to stabilize the brain cells. The cognitive brain cells tend to be very long because they're crisscrossing the brain um, and they need the tau protein to stabilize the microtubules through which the nutrients and everything for the brain cell are transported. So what happens again, for some reason we don't understand this, tau protein changes its configuration, and then in this new configuration it starts to replicate itself, and it replicates and replicates to the extent that it then bursts the brain cell, and we're just left with this familiar terminology, the tau tangle. But what, again, once the brain cell is destroyed, that's the end of the brain cell. But more sort of uh, concerning with the tau protein is that the abnormal tau protein can jump across the synapse from one brain cell to the next. And this is how it spreads around the brain. And it spreads around the brain in a predictable fashion called Brach staging. And that's why on the whole, you tend to start with short-term memory problems, and then it sort of moves to the frontal lobes, the temporal lobes, the parietal lobes, and you develop all of these other symptoms. And unfortunately, the rate at which it spreads around the brain gathers pace because obviously you've got one brain cell that you know, will infect, so to speak, in inverted commas, one brain cell. But if you've got 100 million brain cells, in the next second, it will um, have affected um, whatever, a, a billion brain cells. So the rate of progression increases with time. So the new medications are designed to try to remove this tau protein from the brain. So there's sort of two or three ways of doing this, but we have medications at the minute that are dissolving the tau protein within the brain cell. So the brain cell extrudes it and therefore it's no longer present. It's left the body. And so it can't infect or affect the next brain cell. So effectively, the less you have, the less you get. The other types of medications, which are mainly monoclonal antibodies, will remove the tau protein, this sort of picture at the bottom where the star is, they will remove the tau protein as they're jumping from one brain cell to the next. So effectively in the extracellular space, they just sort of like remove it out of the, out of the system. So next slide, please. Um, so you can sort of see that these new generation medications really are very different from the current medications. So next slide, please. So in order to appreciate where we're going, just one quick slide here on how do the current treatments work? Well, well as you know, the, the way they work is that they, when the nerve impulse comes down through the cognitive brain cell, it releases acetylcholine from the distal end of the proximal nerve. That acetylcholine effectively carries the chemical message across to the next nerve. And in order to um, maintain an equilibrium, you have acetylcholinesterase. So when someone wants to sort of be firing on all cylinders, the acetylcholinesterase is relatively quiescent. But when you want to, you know, crudely, when you want to go to sleep, let's say the acetylcholinesterase becomes more hyperactive and it absorbs the, the acetylcholine to sort of like quieten down the system. So the way the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors work is they just essentially inhibit the acetylcholine esterase so that you have more acetylcholine um, available for, for nerve transmission.
But obviously, because the acetylcholine is produced in the nerve itself, if the nerve itself is being destroyed by the amyloid or the tau, then there sort of comes a point at which the anticholinesterase inhibitors just don't work anymore because you aren't able to produce the acetylcholine in the first place because the nerve cells have been destroyed. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so the sort of goal really is not so much to treat dementia. The goal is going to be to have a scenario where you have Alzheimer's disease without dementia. So this is really just sort of showing schematically, you start with a normal brain, and obviously you don't wake up one morning with dementia, but very slowly, whilst you're completely asymptomatic, i.e. you're completely clinically normal, the amyloid in the tau protein are developing and moving around in the brain. And this process starts about 20 years before we actually develop the first symptom. So actually it's a sort of like an ideal disease in so much as you have 20 years in which to detect the presence of disease, treat someone who's asymptomatic, and thereby prevent them from ideally ever developing symptoms. At the minute, we're sort of like in the clinical trials, we're definitely treating people with very mild cognitive impairment and pretty much sort of like, you know, in, in practice, it tends to be people have got mild AD dementia or moderate dementia by the time they present. And at that point, we're just basically beyond trying to slow it down. At that point, it's really just a case of trying to give them the symptomatic anticholinesterase inhibitors or memantine just to try and get whatever, you know, whatever energy you can out of the existing brain cells. So again, it's just saying the new brain cells are stopping, the new generation medications are stopping the brain cells from dying in the first place. And I'll go into this in more detail, but I've just basically listed, there are a plethora of these new drugs in development now and getting very, very close to coming on the market. Um, they're anti-amyloid, anti-tau, but they also are sort of like vaccines, they're anti-inflammatory medications, epigenetic and, and antitoxin type medications. And we've been working with all of these different medications over the last few years. Next slide, please. Um, so as I said, it's not just having new treatments, it's also having sort of like new sensitive, affordable ubiquitous biomarkers so we can find evidence of the disease early. So what are these? So next slide, please. So these, these obviously in the future will be able to be used for prevention, but currently they're used for confirming symptomatic disease and for monitoring response to treatment. Um, and I, I think really suffice to say many they're amyloid in their tau biomarkers, but it's really a sort of like this biomarker evolution is what's actually redefined Alzheimer's. And actually the sort of current um, diagnose, the current definition of Alzheimer's now is a biological entity defined entirely by amyloid tau and other new neurodegenerative biomarkers, irrespective of clinical symptoms or functional decline. So it's much the same as diabetes. I and mean, diabetes is a, a biomarker diagnosis now, rather than, you know, like the fact that your legs are dropping off or you're going blind. It, it's really the fact that you've got elevated uncontrolled blood sugar. So, so next slide, please. So this is really, without going into too much detail, is just saying we have, a lot of these biomarkers. So MRI structural imaging is obviously available. Um, glucose FTG PET scan looking at metabolic activity of the brain is available. CSF amyloid and tau is available. Um, amyloid PET is, is more limited availability. It's available privately. It is available in the NHS, particularly for younger patients. Um, and then there are the CSF amyloid tau inflammatory biomarkers, PET, tau scans to pick up tau protein. And now we're getting into amyloid um, tests, uh, sorry, amyloid and tau tests um, and other neuroinflammatory markers on blood testing. But those latter few are just available in the trials at the minute, but will we'll come onto the market. Next, please. So again, this is just another way of expressing it, but I think we really have to think of Alzheimer's as a totally new paradigm. And everyone is on this continuum. So you're either normal clinically and you have no biomarkers or you're normal clinically and you have some early biomarkers present. This will be the future for treating people who are pre symptomatic okay. Or you've crossed the midline where you now have mild cognitive impairment and you've got lots of biomarkers or you're right down the end here with Alzheimer's disease, dementia, and you've got lots and lots of biomarkers. And all that you can sort of do is try and help people to, to manage what's a pretty horrendous disease. Um, next, next slide, please. 
So just in terms of treatment, I think it is important to just emphasize that at a global level, at least 30% um, of the development of dementia due to Alzheimer's is the result of modifiable risk factors. So, you know, it's a bit like smoking. It doesn't necessarily affect one individual person, but certainly if the whole sort of like world could modify their diet, that's really sort of like a Mediterranean more ketotic type diet, Exercise is incredibly important, limiting alcohol, stopping smoking, keeping your brain active, adequate sleep, and to a certain extent, reducing stress are all factors that can actually downregulate the genetic predisposition. And that doesn't mean inherited, it just means sort of like gene biomarkers for, for Alzheimer's. And in fact, exercise is probably the single most important that has been shown in big um, sort of like demographic studies to actually reduce risk. Um, and obviously it's always good to do these things at any time because people, if, even if you have got Alzheimer's, you'll feel better if you, if you do these things. So next slide, please. Um, so are we getting closer to the answer? And I think this is possibly a question that many of your patients or your patients sort of like sons and daughters will ask you. And, and we're sort of getting closer, but we're also realizing it's more complex. So Alzheimer's definitely is not one disease, is, is many different sort of conditions. Um, and each is caused by the collapse of the systems crucial to the function of brain cells that do our thinking. Clearly genetic flaws most probably are hastening this process, but the most powerful force is something beyond our control, which is essentially the passage of time. So the passage of time probably is acting through our genes, but at the minute, you know, that is the most common risk factor. Um, and we don't really understand that terribly well. But as I said, the first drug was approved last year, and there are many more now in the pipeline currently in clinical trials. So next slide, please. So this is really just saying there will be, for people who've got mild cognitive impairment, there'll be many different biomarkers and for each, or each, many different abnormalities for each of which there'll be a biomarker and for each of which there'll be a treatment. So it's sort of really pretty much like cancer or infection or anything else. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, as I said, there won't be sort of like one treatment, one cure. And actually where the sort of like sharp end now of sort of like focus on treatment is going in terms of the clinical trials and how these drugs will be used when they come on the market um, is really looking at, you know, what's the optimal time for intervention, which biomarkers, which treatments at which stages of the disease, how long do you treat, will it be short pulses, will it be intermittent treatment, will it be a, you know, like a once in a lifetime vaccine type treatment. Um, will there be sequential treatments? Will you first treat amyloid, then you start treating tau, then you start treating other proteins? Um, age of presentation will obviously be much, much lot earlier. And we will most likely be screening everybody sort of in their 50s. We actually have a study coming up later this year, which have, is for people who are completely cognitively normal for one of these medications. And the idea, idea being to identify the risk factors in terms of the biomarkers. And then commence treatment so that the individuals who are at risk have all the biomarkers, the time at which they first develop symptoms is pushed out by many years or maybe even never. Um, measuring the success of treatment is obviously really, really important. We can measure that we can reduce these amyloid proteins, we can measure we can reduce the tau proteins, but the really important thing is measuring clinical me meaningfulness. So it's all right, you know, changing the proteins um, and correcting them, but it has to also correlate with slowing down, halting, or even if possible, improving um, cognitive function. And most likely, it will obviously be like everything. It'll be a combination of treatments. So next slide, please. So there are, as I mentioned, there's like other mechanisms other than the amyloid and tau. And this is really just to say there's epigenetic gene silencing, antiviral, and all sorts of other neuroinflammatory um, medications that are designed to sort of like decrease the toxicity of the amyloid and tau. Next slide, please. And these are just clinical trials that, that we're doing at the minute in all these with all these different types of drugs. And as you can see, it's looking at production clearance um, and damage caused by, by the various proteins. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I just put this one in really as a last one to sort of say, you know, this is all very well. And, you know, is this something that our patients can actually do at the minute? And actually the, the answer to that question is, is yes. And all across the world, um, particularly with all of the sort of like the PR and the sort of hype and everything that's going on because of the aducanumab or aduhelm, 
people now increasingly realize, or as I say, their families realize that this is, this is, you know, Alzheimer's, they realize they're most likely to have Alzheimer's as their cause of dementia, particularly if they're getting older. They also realize that with current medications on the market, this is a relentlessly progressive disease. And there is no option other than that either they die before or they die with um, developing dementia. And, and it's, it is a horrific disease as, as everyone on this call will be, av will be aware. Um, and so it is just to say that I, I have looked and I know there isn't a, a trial site in, in Jersey, um, but obviously, and we actually do have some patients from Jersey on our trials. We've got one or two people who've been on them for quite some time. But if people who have got mild cognitive impairment um, are interested, this is something that they can just, you know, you can call us or they can just call us. And the nice thing about it is that everything on the trial is completely free. So effectively get hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of investigations and um, monitoring and access to medications. But obviously, like all, like all clinical trials, um, once, once somebody is randomized into a clinical trial, um, then they, um, they are, they're randomized into taking drug or placebo. But most of the studies we're doing now, because they're final phase, at the end of the randomized part of the trial, they will actually um, then go on to the next phase where everybody gets the active medication. And it's probably at the minute, to be fair, even best case scenario, before a drug gets on the market and approved by NICE and available through the NHS, we're probably talking three, four plus years. So um, I think that's the last one actually. Next slide, please. Yeah. Um, so this really is, um, I hope has been helpful in terms of I think you all know the current treatments for, for dementia, um, but I just wanted to give you a sort of like a, a view as to well, what we're doing, but also what's available out there now for people with mild cognitive impairment with the view to really trying to prevent them from developing dementia. Thank you. Dr. Sweeney, thank you for an absolutely fascinating talk. And I'm sure there will be some questions. I think either post questions in the chat or, or raise your hand if you know how to do that on Zoom. But just while we're waiting, I, one thought that occurs to me, as, as this is clearly and increasingly an amyloid-based disease, are we looking at, because in systemic amyloid, we use thalidomide analogs to try and help reduce the amyloid burden. Is there any benefit from drugs like lenalidomide in um, Alzheimer's or does the tau protein confuse it? So, so I think there's two things. One is that the tau protein, so, so the amyloid protein is slightly different, which is a bit like all these amyloid proteins they are. And this is a, this is a specific amyloid protein. Um, and it's even different from if you have cerebral amyloid, that's different from the amyloid protein that causes, um, causes Alzheimer's. Um, the other thing is that the, to be honest, the focus is moving in terms of developing the new medications much towards the tau now. And the reason for that being that it seems to be that the amyloid somehow triggers the tau. And then once the tau gets started, it's the tau that really spreads around the brain. So even if you sort of like clear the amyloid, by the time the tau's been started, um, you really have to clear the tau if you, if you want to stop this process. So most people feel that the likely scenario will be the future will be using the anti-amyloid probably 10, 15 years before you develop symptoms. Um, because at that time, the amyloid is present, but it's sort of like before it's triggered the tau. Um, so you probably start with anti-amyloid almost like as a preventative medication. But once you start to develop symptoms, you're probably really an into anti-tau and, and other sort of like mechanisms that will decrease the toxicity of the tau. Brilliant. And all the you. other things that we don't know about yet. <laughs> and, and I would imagine monoclonals directly against tau protein are probably the yeah. next step, aren't they? So we have um, those at the minute. Yeah, we have a we have a big study at the minute called called Together. Um, and that's a monoclonal antibody against tau. Um, so there's there are several, several of those in in um, yeah, in final phase studies at the moment. Um, and then there's also a drug, it's uh, called LMTM, which is probably going to report its results quite soon this year, actually. And that's the one that dissolves the abnormal tau inside the brain cells. So the brain cells just extrude it and then it just goes out of the body. We have one question in the chat so far. And the question is from Claire. 
Does a person need to have a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment from a memory assessment service to access clinical trials with you? Or would a diagnosis from a GP be appropriate? The answer is they don't have to have a diagnosis. Um, if, a, if the GP has made a diagnosis, like that's great, um, but they don't have to have a diagnosis. And in fact, the vast majority of people that we see will have contacted us like from Facebook or, you know, from radio adverts, things like that. And um, we do a fairly intensive pre-screening, just sort of like questions over the phone and everything with the individual. And actually, to be honest, it's not really very difficult. Um, and we just go through the different cognitive domains. Um, and then if we think they're sort of like, you know, it sounds like, yeah, you know, this sort of like sounds right, then we'll bring them in. And then um, we will um, make the diagnosis clinically as we're, as we're seeing them and consenting them onto the study, et cetera. I mean, obviously if they don't sound like the diagnosis, we won't consent them, but we'll consent them onto the study. And then they start the screening. And it's during the screening that we try to match them exactly to the cognitive profile of a particular study, which will be the sweet spot for where that drug works. And then if they match that, then we just check physically they're really fit, they're fit and healthy. And then we do the MRI, then we do the PET amyloid, then we do the PET tau, then we do various biomarker blood tests and things. So when we get them right through to the stage where we're making confirmed sort of like diagnosis and randomizing them into the study, they've got like literally the most accurate diagnosis in the world. But we have lots and lots of people who come and see us who've been diagnosed at, you know, the most, um, I don't know, the most famous um, memory services in the country. Um, but actually they don't have amyloid or tau, you know, they're, they've just got the wrong diagnosis. <laughs> So it's, it's a very, very difficult diagnosis to make clinically, to, to make it accurately. But at the same time, it's also, it's easy to just write, ask the right clinical questions. Yeah, and I know Pierre's going to speak about diagnosis shortly. Um, there are no other questions currently. I think just as a, uh, an extra question for myself, I think one of the problems we have in primary care is that we are aware of the limitations, as you um, elegantly described, of the current medication and how they can almost stall progression of the disease but not reverse it. And yeah. so there is sometimes, I think, a disincentive almost yeah. to rush to use those medications because there's a feeling that they're not that effective. I don't know what your thoughts would be about that. Yeah. So in terms of the in terms of the symptomatic treatments, yeah. No, I think there's a lot of logic in that, and there, there's so many different opinions on it. So in the US, they just start all medications straight away. It's a bit on denepezil and amantine, you know, like when you've got very mild cognitive impairment. Um, in France, they don't use anticholinesterase inhibitors at all. I think it's fair to say because they just think it's a waste of time and a waste of money. I think in the UK people tend to start using them when you've got mild AD dementia as sort of like defined by the, you know, interfering with activities of daily living. But I think really the sort of like logic is, is there's two things to the logic. One is that a third of people can't tolerate it. A third of people get no benefit and a third of people get benefit and can tolerate it um, for a period of time. Um, the other thing is because of the mechanism of action, if you start, if you have someone and you start Nepazil today, um, the benefit, uh, say if you stop an episode today, the benefit that that episode will have in say one year and one week will be X because it can only act in one year and one week and only act on the brain cells that are alive at that moment in time. Mm -hmm. If you have that same patient and you start the denepazil in one year, then in one year and one week, or maybe one year and three weeks, it will have exactly the same effect as if you'd started it today, because it will still only be able to act on the brain cells that, you know, learning, it can only, you know, like increase the acetylcholine that is being released from the brain cells that are functioning. So, so one of the arguments is that, well, you may as well have the benefit for as long as possible. One of the other arguments is, you know, if you're worried about side effects and things like that, well, if someone's functioning okay, you may as well wait until, um, you know, until they're beginning to sort of like notice more of a difference. But, but I think the key thing is just sort of like remembering that it's, it's, only going to it's only going to act on the brain cells that are alive at the time that you give it. 
Um, probably the only exception to that is if somebody is getting hallucinations, it probably is worth starting rivastigmine because people do find the hallucinations quite unsettling. Um, and then if people have got more sort of like aggressive type behavior, they've got a bit more frontal sort of behavior with their Alzheimer's, even though it may be quite early, um, it probably is worth starting the mantine because that sort of works, works more on those sorts of symptoms. Um, but yeah, it is, it is sort of, um, it, is, it is difficult. <laughs> it's particularly difficult when you know, you know what's going on for the individual and um, yeah. <laughs> But the nice thing about the the nice thing about the trials actually, which is nearly all of the trials you can be on, Dinepazil, et cetera, and come into the clinical trial. So there's only one or two trials where you you can't be on them because the drug in the study interacts with them. But most of the studies you can be on that as long as you've been on a stable dose for at least three months. Um, so you can sort of be on that and then have access to the new medication. So, you know, you've sort of got, you know, cake and eat it. You can have both. <laughs> Brilliant. No, thank you so much for what was an absolutely fascinating presentation. And I think it's thrilling to hear that there are advances in monoclonal antibodies that will hopefully help people going forward. But yeah. no, Dr. McSweeney, many thanks for a brilliant talk. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. We're going to um, move on to our Next speaker, um, Dr. Kralak Salmon is a neurologist and geriatrician from the University uh, Hospital in Lyon uh, with research interests, including biomarkers um, and predictors of autonomy loss in dementia. Um, he's an absolute expert in this field and he's going to speak to us around the concept of diagnosing dementia in the first place, as well as dementia medication um, in, in the second <laughs> part. So, um, Pierre, many thanks for joining us this evening. I'm assuming you're joining us from your, your hometown of Lyon. Yes, good evening, everybody. I'm very happy to be here with you. Uh, this is not uh, on my back, it's a, it's a screen, uh, but, uh, but it's Lyon indeed. Um, so thank you very much for inviting me to, to, to share this consideration regarding the, the diagnosis of dementia or neurocognitive disorder. May I have the opportunity to share my screen? Uh, it's not yet available. Just coming now, I think. Mm. Can okay. I just remind everybody to yes. mute their um, devices just while we're um, while the speaker is speaking? Thank you. Okay, good. Can you see my screen, full screen? Okay, yep. very good. So, uh, so to better treat uh, our patients, to to take care of these patients and the caregiver, we need a. Uh, the most accurate uh, diagnosis. I, I would say diagnosis of neurocognitive disorder because in some countries, uh, including France, we cannot use the, the term uh, dementia, which is very stigmatized. Uh, it's associated to fullness, to psychiatry, and uh, we, we mostly use now th these terms of neurocognitive disorders that uh, comes from, uh, come from the DSM-5. Uh, the psychiatric, uh, the international psychiatric classification. So what we're going to look at is the, the main, uh, are the main complaints and situation at risk and how to, to enhance the diagnosis rates and how to, to fight against uh, stigma, um, uh, which are in the general population and in, uh, in the physicians and all professionals. And we are going to consider a hierarchized and personalized diagnosis strategy that has been proposed uh, across Europe, uh, thanks to uh, European uh, joint action on, uh, on dementia. And I think it's, uh, this joint action was very helpful. So what is the case uh, roughly in primary care? Uh, GPs, as you know, are very frequently confronted to, to memory complaints, to cognitive complaints, and to mild cognitive impairment, and then dementia. 
and uh, they are not uh, well uh, all well trained to that and they don't do not have the, the the right tools because the tools are very difficult to 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 precise and to to build them and there are lots of breaks of uh, detecting and diagnosis uh, alzheimer's disease and uh, related disease but GPs have a central room for the detection, the diagnosis, and the care of these people and their caregiver. So, so we have to, to, to work on that and to, to, to try to enhance the rates of the detection in, uh, in general population and in primary care. Um, we, we know that the GPs cannot uh, uh, rightly uh, diagnose neurocognitive disorders in a, uh, during a classical visit. We, we have to, to organize specific visits for these people and to spend some time. And the GPs, we know that they do not have time. So we, we have to think about that all together. And I will speak about some examples in France uh, coming from the, from the authorities. I, in France, we have only uh, 50 to 60 percent of the people who are diagnosed. I think it's the case in most of the, the, the occidental countries. So we have to improve this diagnosis and we are going to see why we have to, to improve this diagnosis. So as I said, uh, diagnosis and detection is time consuming. And we have also to, to better motivate the people, the physicians, the professionals to, to detect and diagnose these people without any uh, curative treatment, without, without any treatment that, um, that targets the lesions for the moment. Even if the research uh, and clinical trials are very rich, we do not have this kind of treatment for the moment. Uh, the patients and the caregivers can be a barrier for detection and assessment, and uh, we do not have the, the, the perfect uh, tools, the perfect instruments to detect and diagnose this uh, clinically this syndrome, so we have to use biomarkers, but we, we will speak about this. We have to, to face some diseases like Alzheimer's disease. Um, who um, represent, uh, who are represented by um, a continuum, a continuum of lesions and a continuum of clinical symptoms. And um, all starts, the, 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 the symptoms starts with the subjective cognitive decline that has been uh, well uh, described in this paper in the Lancet Neurology in 2020 by Frank Jason and, and his team. And uh, we, we, you know, and we know that uh, the people coming for subjective cognitive complaint can present with um, a complaint that can be reversible in case of anxiety, transient anxiety, transient depression. It can be stable, it can be chronic uh, in case of uh, chronic depression, for instance, or it can be a real complaint at risk for a progressive uh, cognitive decline for, um, um, for a disease underlying the, the cognitive decline and, uh, and functional impairment. So this is, this is this third kind of subjective cognitive complaint that we have to pick up. What are the features of this uh, subjective cognitive complaint at risk for a, a neurodegenerative disease? Um, this kind of complaint um, relates mostly to memory, uh, to, to episodic memory. Uh, this is the, the, the first cognitive uh, sectors that is, um, that is concerned by, by this. This complaint should last uh, less than five years. Generally, we, we see patients and uh, caregivers complaining uh, for less than two years or one year and a half. This is quite short in the, in the lifetime. This, um, this um, complaints um, uh, concern mostly people after 60 year old. 
uh, we, 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 we diagnose some patients with uh, Alzheimer's disease or frontotemporal dementia uh, who are less uh, than uh, 60 year old, but uh, these cases are mostly genetic and we have a, a, a family story that is very strong in these cases which uh, who are, represent uh, less than 2% of the, of the consultations. Uh, this kind of complaint worries the patient and mostly the caregivers, as you know, and it persists uh, over time. Um, and uh, it's, um, it's so intense, it's, it's so concerning the, the, the people that it triggers uh, some medical help, some medical consultation. And uh, it's observed mostly by the by, by the, the caregiver. We we have to to have in mind uh, to that all these diseases are um, included in a continuum. Here you have the example of Alzheimer's disease, and we speak about stages. We are very progressive. You see, the first stage of the disease uh, relies on lesions in the brain without any complaint, without any cognitive decline. This is the pre-symptomatic phase of the disease. Um, maybe in the future, we will treat this. We will treat this with, um, with medication which target the lesions before the symptoms. And we, we can consider also this stage in uh, genetic families. And we, the, 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 page, the people with a mutation, they can participate to clinical trials before, before a complaint and before an, uh, an impairment. Stage two is the, the, the mild, uh, the, is the subjective cognitive complaint stage. Uh, we can observe in, at that stage some uh, very mild behavioral symptoms like irritability, anxiety, or depression, but without any cognitive impairment, not for the moment. Stage three is the stage of the mild neurocognitive impairment without any auto autonomy loss. The people are still autonomy, auton are, are not dependent, they are still independent, but we, we diagnose a cognitive decline regarding the, the, the cognitive neuropsychological assessment. And then we have the three stages of the of dementia, mild, moderate, and severe dementia, with a, a dependency with an autonomy loss. So we have to, to keep that in mind. And maybe, and I'm sure of that, in the future, we will, we will uh, uh, diagnose these people very early in this process. So in the DSM-5, we have the, the, two, uh, the two definitions of neurocognitive disorders, the mild stage and the major stage of neurocognitive disorder. That is very helpful because we can communicate on the, on the diagnosis before the, the autonomy loss, before the dependency. So uh, you have the definition. It's a cognitive impairment that can be very modest, uh, in the mild neurocognitive disorder or significant in the major stage. But the most, the, the most important different difference between mild and major stages uh, relies on the autonomy loss. The mild neurocognitive disorder is associated with, uh, with no dependency, no autonomy loss, and then you have the autonomy loss. It's not, it's chronic, it's not a delirium and it's, organic, it's, um, it's not mental, it's not psychiatric. So uh, with these two uh, symptomatic stages, you can, you can pick up different etiological diseases. The most, um, the most important, the most frequent disease is Alzheimer's disease, but then you have vascular encephalopathy, Lewy body disease, Parkinson disease with cognitive disorders, frontotemporal lobar de uh, degeneration, and uh, all the other um, all the other etiologies, which are very important to consider, and the diag the differential diagnosis is very important to consider. 
So we have now some uh, diagnosis criteria for all these diseases, and these criteria are very specific, very, very precise. Why do we diagnose these people without any, uh, without any therapeutics uh, that uh, target the lesions, with, without any uh, curative approach for the moment? Uh, this is the list of the benefits that uh, were uh, collected by uh, the last um, European Joint Action on Dementia. Uh, the, two, the two Joint Actions actually, Alcove and then Acton, Anton, Acton Dementia, that was the second one. And um, it was a, a consensus regarding the benefits. Uh, I, I don't have time to, to, pre to specify all them, but you can read the, the, the right to know is very important for uh, differential diagnosis and information on the prognosis and uh, uh, the time to adjust the plan and the security, the ability to make decisions depends on the diagnosis. Uh, the, 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 diagno the, the care pathways improve the quality of life of both the, the patients and the caregiver. The access to, to, to non-pharmacological therapeutics and pharmacological therapeutics, uh, innovation, services, right. and access to research. This is our duty to oh, present. I'm going to tell you something that I think you are not going to want to hear. Sorry. Uh, it's, uh, it's our duty to present the clinical trials to these people. It's important to explain the families, the caregivers, to, to explain the changes because it helps to decrease the pressure in the family and uh, in the close relative. And um, it's important to access to services and to, to, to organize some help at home and so on. And there are some benefits for the society. The risks are mostly related to negative attitudes and to misdiagnosis. Mm, how do we how do we build our diagnosis strategy? So this is a this is the frame of the diagnosis strategy that has been built by the European Joint Action on Dementia, and. Uh, uh, you, you, you will see that it's very personalized and it's very hierarchical, step by step. First, we have the patients and or the caregiver complaints that can uh, be memory, uh, language, and so on, or situation at risk. Somebody dealing with medication without any uh, memory can be very at risk. Then uh, it triggers, it should trigger a first detection stage, uh, detection step of the, of the strategy. And it mostly relies on GPs, on primary care. So we can involve also nurses, dementia coordinators, uh, and maybe sometimes some, some already some uh, specialists in some uh, European countries. We have to uh, pick up the comorbidities, including the mental, the psychological comorbidities, depression, anxiety, the drug prescription. And we have to, to provide here at this first step of the diagnosis, the, a, a very um, extensive assessment, including cognition. And we have uh, some uh, tools which are very, very nice to detect the neurocognitive disorder, not to uh, specify the etiological diagnosis at that stage, but to detect the neurocognitive disorder. You have this general practitioner assessment of cognition that is very helpful with two parts. The first part or the step two here with um, a question regarding the complaint and the type of complaint, the type of situation that is um, provided by the caregiver. And you have a second part of the, of the test uh, that is a screening testing of the, of the patient, very rapid screening testing, few minutes, that are um, this this, uh, this test is very interesting to to pick up the the, the mild or the major cognitive disorder. This um, this second test is also very efficient. It's very rapid. You just have to to give the year, to give the months, to give uh, we we give a, a name and an address of somebody, and uh, after some. Um, 
other testing, we, we, we ask this uh, information back. It's very rapid and it helps to pick up the, the cognitive complaints at risk. Importantly, it's not helpful for uh, etiological diagnosis. It won't be helpful for the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or Lewy body disease or frontotemporal dementia. It's just to pick up the, the complaints at risk. We have, a, uh, sorry for the French here, we have some data, some statistics on the, on the, the diagnosis performance of all these tests, these tests, tests in, uh, in primary care. You have the sensibility, the specificity, the predictive values of this uh, test. No test is perfect. And uh, we have to, to, to advise the, the physicians to, to pick up some testing. They, don't, they do not have to do all that, only one or two to specify the, the complaint. After the cognition, we have to assess the, the function, the autonomy, and the most, um, most uh, well-known uh, test is uh, this load on instrumental activities of daily living. And you can see the... The questions here, I, I won't get uh, through this, uh, this document, but this is very helpful to, to pick up uh, the loss of autonomy. Then we have different situations. The first and uh, very frequent situation is the diagnosis in primary care at this first test step, uh, the diagnosis of a psychiatric condition. It can be anxiety, depression, and we have one third of our uh, memory consultation, memory clinic consultation, uh, which are related to psychiatric condition. It's very frequent. And the GP or the professional here can deal with this uh, condition and provide some therapeutics. Sometimes there is nothing, all is normal, but as soon as, as there is a, a complaint, we have to provide some uh, secondary prevention program physical activity, diet, social interaction, and clinical trials also uh, are available. Sometimes it's a diagnosis of a major neurocognitive disorder, whatever the etiology, whatever the cause, and then we all admitted that for the, 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 uh, the appropriate the, the, the etiological diagnosis, we need some specialized um, approach by the neurologist, the psychiatrist, or the geriatrician, helping the GP to, to, to specify the etiological uh, diagnosis. We have also, uh, there are uh, GPs who, who, who are very well trained and they can also provide some uh, uh, the, the etiological diagnosis. We need some brain MRI, we need some blood testing, not for biomarkers, but to to pick up some thyroid dysfunction, some uh, metabolic dysfunction, and sometimes we need very extensive neuropsychological testing. Then we can provide uh, the, the, the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease and related diseases and trigger the, the post-diagnosis supports. Sometimes it's dif uh, differential diagnosis, metabolic, hydrocephaly, uh, subdural hematoma, and so on and so on. It triggers some uh, therapeutics. And sometimes it's very complex, focal atrophy, very young patients, rapid dementia. And then we can have a third line of uh, diagnosis tools uh, with the biomarkers, CSF, SPECT imaging, PET imaging, electrophysiology, and so on. Then we can have a diagnosis of encephalitis, uh, Crossfeld-Jacob disease, paraneoplastic, and so on and so on. What was a good, uh, a good uh, advance uh, all together with the GP community, the specialists, was to consider also the mild neurocognitive disorder stage, which should trigger the etiological uh, diagnosis stages and should trigger also some information, some more information to the patient and the caregiver so that they decide to be part of, um, to, to access of, uh, to access to a, a secondary prevention program and also clinical trials. And if they want to specify the diagnosis, they have to access to, to biomarkers. What we have to keep in mind is that if we perform only 
the, the, the memory uh, consultation, the brain MRI, the neuropsychological testing, and the first step of the, the strategy, the, the, the diagnosis value of this is only two thirds, is only 65% of uh, uh, positive and negative predictive value. If we want to reach 95% of precision, we need so the biomarkers. You will fuck off. So that's very important to keep in mind if we want there. to be precise. And I think uh, it's my last slide. Um, uh, just to, to, to illustrate my, my conclusion is the, what we use in France, and uh, that was very helpful for, for the physicians and the professional to, to think in terms, to, to think about the etiological diagnosis. We think about the clinical syndrome. It can be a memory complaint, memory impairment, it can be dis-executive frontal impairment, it can be atten attention, uh, language disorders, visual, spatial, and so on. Second uh, line, uh, the stage. We have to, to think about the stage. Is it, is it pre-symptomatic? That can be in some uh, families with uh, mutation, genetic mutations. Is it the, the stage of the subjective cognitive decline without any impairment? Is it the stage of the minor cognitive decline or the major neurocognitive decline? And then you have the third dimension, the lesions, the underlying lesions. It can be atypical neurodegenerations. It can be amyloid and tar related to Alzheimer's disease lesions. It can be vascular. It can be Lewy body. And yes. we have to, to be very specific with these lesions, lesion diagnosis. We need the biomarkers because as, a, as it was said earlier, the clinics and the, the first stages of the, the strategy, the diagnosis strategy, are not so good for a, a very uh, precise diagnosis. So we need to, to keep in mind these three, um, these three dimensions. I want just, just to, 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 to end on this, um, we, we did a, a research program on, on the role of the advanced practice nurses to help the GPs to pick up the, the neurocognitive disorders, to better detect the neurocognitive disorders. I think you have this in, uh, in UK and in Jersey. Uh, it's very helpful. It's multidisciplinary uh, teams, and it's very helpful to, to, to work on this, on this. It was the results of this um, survey was, were very good in terms of uh, feeling of competency and, um, and um, help, helpness in the, in the diagnosis strategy. So uh, we have to fight against the stigma. We have to know why we detect and diagnose this patient. Uh, we have to, to be very graduated and personalized in the diagnosis strategy. And we have to think about new professionals, uh, multidisciplinary teams to to detect, diagnose these patients and care uh, these patients and these uh, caregivers. Thank you very much for your attention. Mm. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. If I can just uh, again remind people to, to mute their devices um, just uh, while others are speaking. Um, uh, Pierre, that was absolutely fascinating and, and thank you for that um, very detailed description of, of the kind of diagnostics. I'm, I'm struck by a couple of things you said. One, you, you mentioned, and I strongly agree with this, this is not a psychiatric diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And yet, certainly in the UK, it is often, the diagnosis is often handled by psychiatric units rather than by neurologists. Is, is that the same in, in France and the rest of Europe, or is it a very mixed picture? No, in France, we, we have very few uh, psychiatrists who participate to the diagnosis strategy, uh, mostly, mostly geriatricians and neurologists. But um, it, it is the case uh, in other countries than UK. And um, I think all depends on the, the trainings of the, of the professionals. There are some psychiatrists we, which are, who are very good to, to diagnose these diseases, but um, they have to, to, to be... Um, 
to have they have to keep in mind that that these diagnoses are really neurological and whatever the physician they have to 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 keep that in mind but uh, in france no very few psychiatrists yeah thank you we have a question in the chat um and this i think goes back to the beginning of your presentation where you used the term from the lancet article subjective cognitive decline and the question from christine says why subjective cognitive decline rather than objective cognitive decline um, which is i think something really that you you touched on later in the talk with the difficulties in the early stages hmm. that's a good point it could be objective cognitive decline uh, um, it's subjective cognitive decline because it's the beginning of the cognitive decline but uh, the testing is still normal so you can have a you can have you can have a, a cognitive performance that is uh, already declining, but if you test the patient, it's in the normal range. So it's only a feeling, a personal feeling of cognitive decline, of memory decline. I know that something is wrong in me uh, regarding the, the memory or is wrong uh, regarding my, my partner, but uh, it's too early for us, for the neuropsychological testing to, to pick up the abnormality because it's very high in the performance still. So it's a subjective uh, feeling that something is decreasing. Um, there's a follow-up message from Christine saying they could be de-arrest. I'm not sure what that, I think that's a typo there. Um, I don't know, Christine, do you want to unmute and ask the question directly? Depressed. Ah, yes. So sorry, she said they could be depressed, which again, I think you um, I think you, you said about 30 percent of people seen in memory services have an alternative mental health diagnosis. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, anxiety and depression provide some uh, attention disorders. And uh, if you if you have uh, some anxiety in, the, in mind, you, you cannot focalize your attention on uh, on specific in information and you cannot get that in the in the memory network so anxiety is the the highest enemy of uh, of attention and memory we know that so we have roughly one third one third of our memory consultations uh, which are related to anxiety and depression but but uh, we have also to 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 keep in mind that if you feel that your memory is declining because of uh, uh, the beginning of Alzheimer's disease, it, it also provides some anxiety and depression. So you have a, a link, you have uh, two sides of links between, the, between the, some psychological changes and uh, the, the neurological disease. So it's very difficult and um, years ago i would have said maybe five or ten years ago i would have said it's uh, quite uh, easy to to uh, differentially diagnose uh, attention disorders uh, linked to anxiety or depression versus um, uh, the beginning of alzheimer's disease now we know that in the very very well-known uh, memory clinics, university centers, we know that everybody has at least um, 30 to 35 percent of misdiagnosis because, the, the, because of this very difficult relationship between uh, the, the, the symptoms who, who, which are very neurological and also integrated with uh, uh, psychological changes. So we now I say to my patients, I think it's anxiety. I think it's OK. I think uh, uh, I can follow up. Uh, I, I can follow you. I can um, uh, we, we, you can have rest and it, it, it's not so bad. But I tell them. I can misdiagnose something very mild for you. And if you really want to be precise, 
uh, we have to get the CSF or PET imaging because we, we need the biomarkers. And, and now the, the people, they understand that. Some people say, yes, uh, I will come back next year and we will see if it's uh, worse or, or it's okay. Also, and some people say, I want to know now, I want the biomarkers. And it's the choice of the patient. Yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier about not using the term dementia in France. And Claire has asked um, the question, has using neurocognitive disorder as a diagnosis made any difference in people seeking diagnosis or the outcome of the emotional response to being diagnosed? Yes, I think it's a term, it's a, it's a question of semantic and lexics. Demence, demence in French, demence uh, means fullness. It's yes. a uh, we think about people in the 19th century in uh, in uh, asylums. In, uh, so it's I cannot say to a patient you are you are demented in French. I cannot say that, and I cannot say to a caregiver your your partner or your parent is demented. So um, we we have to deal with that. And uh, by saying you have a cognitive disorder, it's a syndrome. It's, it's a fact, it's a syndrome. There is a cognitive decline or you have a memory disease. And then we are going to uh, look at the etiological diagnosis. To, to, we are going to look at the cause of this syndrome. I think it's okay with the patients. It's okay uh, uh, with the people and it's not so stigmatized than the, the term dementia. And, and I, I don't know if, it's the case in all the Latin countries. I, I, I discussed with Italian people and Spanish people. Dementia was not um, was not so helpful to them. I think it's very French, uh, actually. So maybe um, maybe it's um, only in our country, but um, we 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 do not uh, we we do not speak about dementia. No, I think that's an extremely valuable thing to do and I think that harks back to our point of it as a neurological diagnosis rather than a term as you rightly say the word demented is is objective it, it describes somebody's behavior rather than describing a pathology um, which I think is so extremely important and um, can I ask if there are any further questions either raise hand or, or post it. I, I have one final one. You, you mentioned right at the bottom of your slide about um, prion disease. And, you know, in the UK, we had a, a brief outbreak of Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease from, from beef. Um, is this something that you do see or is it uh, very still an incredibly rare diagnosis? It's a rare diagnosis nowadays, but uh, in our centre, we have one or two cases uh, a year it's not uh, exceptional when we uh, when we see a patient with a, a, a rapid cognitive disorder with a very rapid uh, in few weeks the, 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 the patient present with very uh, very big um, cognitive impairment and also with uh, gay disorders balance disorders and also with myclonus uh, clonus, um, we think about this, and uh, we we go very rapidly to the to the lumbar puncture, the CSF uh, analysis, and uh, also brain MRI is very efficient now to to detect prion disease, um, and we have also some genetic cases. Uh, I'm pretty sure you have some cases in uh, in UK and in Jersey. Uh, we have families with. Um, with this kind of mutation, it's rare, but uh, it's uh, we have some families just close to Lyon in France, and um, it's awful because uh, half of the, the the children have the mutation, and if they have the mutation, they will get uh, the disease. So uh, it's uh, it's rare, but it's uh, it's not treated uh, for the moment. We we do not have any treatment for the moment. Pierre, many thanks for taking the time this evening to talk to us. Absolutely fascinating. And I'm sure everybody here has uh, has really got a huge amount out of it. So so thank you. Um, thank you very much. Some clapping hands going going on. Oh, in fact, there is there is one 
that was a thumbs up. I thought there might be a question there. Um, I'm going to hand over to Claudine Snape, who is our, our sort of CEO of Dementia Jersey, just for some, some final words to wrap up. So I'll mute now and pass over to Claudine. Thanks, thanks very much, Matt. Um, I just wanted to say an absolutely huge thanks to Dr. Um, Pierre Prolac Simon and to um, Dr. Ema McSweeney for their fascinating talks. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, it's part of our series of talks we're doing um, this Deme uh, Dementia Awareness Week, um, you know, which runs throughout the week. You may have seen um, our article in the JEP today or in the supplement that ran on Monday. We've also got um, some awareness messages about the importance of diagnosis in a window in Degushi on the high street. And we've got stalls on the high street. Um, uh, on the next stall, I think, is on Friday now. We'll also be in Waitrose. So we're trying to be uh, in all places to try and raise awareness this week. Um, we've also got a mail drop going out to every household as well um, to, to um, nervously ask people for, for a regular gift so that we can keep going to continue our vital work. So just a big thanks to you all for, for showing up and um, I hope you, you got something from these talks and um, we, will be, um, we will be forwarding your contact details to uh, CPD programmes so that they can be in touch with a certificate um, and the uh, the usual ubiquitous quick survey which we would really appreciate um, you, you filling in so that we can kind of learn and improve these so thanks very much for me.